What do you feel like the biggest lessons that other people should hear are? This is evil, uh, guys. Guys, utilitarianism is evil. Are you ever happy after you eat one of the instant Kraft mac and cheese bowls, or it's always regret? I think I, in that relationship, at least, died mad. It, as it turns out, um, you know, just committing to being not self-contradictory uh, makes you a neoliberal. Like, we should just sort of fire most philosophers. I'm just this, like, tiny unit consumer in a vast, teething swarm of people uh, who could, who, who's, whose existence to them, whose relevance to them, is our capacity to consume their product and pay them money. Fuck you. Uh, you know. Avi, what do you think works well about our friendship? All right, let's... Hi, Elliot! <laughs> Hi, Avi! Welcome uh, to, to the... Be here. Welcome to the Lara Podcast. So, for people who don't know, uh, Avi is a big intellectual influence of mine. He originally started by studying math and econ, um, and then proceeded to do a bunch of really interesting research at the likes of the American Enterprise Institute, the FDA, the FDIC. But this entire time, he's had... Uh, a deep interest in philosophy, and this is where he has a lot of influence in the Maryland intellectual community, um, inspiring inspiring lots of young people, including me, to think better. And uh, and my favorite fact about him is that he's my friend. So thank you, all of you, for being here today, and we're really excited to have you. I love you, Elliot. That was very sweet. Okay, let's get started. I'm very flattered. That, that was by these things. I, I, you know, I, I thought really hard about the introduction. Yeah. The audience cares about the first 15 seconds, so that's what we had to do. Yeah, wow. A lot of accolades. Um, well, what, Avi, what is philosophical pragmatism? Well, if you ask Richard Rorty, he would tell you that it's either anti representationalism or anti authoritarianism. He kind of sees them as similar projects. One is more about philosophy of mind and one is like political. Um, I can't really weave those together very well, uh, but that's what Rorty would say about it. And that's definitely the person that I've heard talk about pragmatism the most. Um, I would say that for him, the anti-representationalism side of it is what I've heard more. Um, he kind of, for him, pragmatism seems to be about encouraging us to use a vocabulary to describe human activities, the human activities that make us interesting, um, a different vocabulary than uh, philosophers like Kant and Descartes were interested in using, which talks about being human as a matter of having certain kinds of special internal representations and uh, a kind of capacity for reason and um, maybe access to a platonic realm. Pragmatism is much more interested in what people do and in using a, uh, an analytical lens that doesn't use the notion of representation quite as much, but is more friendly to kind of like evolutionary metaphors or even sort of um, economic metaphors where they're interested in describing the, uh, the function of different human activities like language use uh, in terms of what we do with it and how it helps us uh, cope with our environment. Um, the, 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 pragma the pragmatic vocabulary that I'm most used to uh, that gets brought up a lot is this idea of coping and, um, and just talking about what people do, uh, do with words, and do with symbols. So why is this philosophy? It seems like if we're trying to study what people do, you could be an ethnographer or biologist or historian, something like that. Where, where does it enter philosophy? Well, a lot of it's about quibbling about the best ways to describe uh, distinctly human practices like language use uh, and also like ethics and science, um, which, you know, if you're quibbling about how to describe things that humans do that seem to make us interesting and special, uh, that pretty much counts as philosophy, probably. Apologies to anyone who knows anything about pragmatism. <laughs> no, that was a great overview, yeah. 
I like that. So, okay, what does... I know something we've discussed a lot, you think a lot about, is what f- pragmatism tells us about philosophy of language. What do you think are the... Like, what is that? What are the most interesting points there? How should we be thinking about what our language actually is and how we use it? I mean, think if I can remember anything useful Brandom had to say generally about pragmatism. Brandom is Bob Brandom, Robert Brandom, a uh, modern American philosopher who's pretty much introduced me to Rorty and also kind of to pragmatism. But it's been a while since I've listened to his lectures about about Rorty. Um, I think it's kind of what I said before. Uh, we use... I guess prag- pragmatists are more interested in talking about the kind of pragmatic side of language use, the like feature of, say, uh, a sentence that they find really interesting. is probably more something like, how are people using the sentence to cope with the world around them to make themselves more adaptive for their environment and to make their life more rewarding? Um, rather than what sort of platonic uh, structure does this sentence uh, convey um, I know, as if it were like code for something. They're probably less interested in the philosophy of language in talking about um, the propositional contents of sentences. Uh, it sounds... Um, yeah... They use a pragmatic meta vocabulary to talk about uh, uh, language use, and again, that seems to the word coping. How people are using words to cope with the world, uh, rather than how they're using words to represent the world, uh, seems to be a big part of it. Um, the kinds of maybe as an example, the kinds of language use that people, the average person, is probably more comfortable to use, talking about using pragmatic vocabulary are probably. Um, you know, and uh, hoots and hollers, like hooray and huzzah, um, you know, performative speech, uh, political speech, which technically is supposed to, you know, could convey something like a proposition or a representation, but has this function that's more about making changes in the world that you would like to see rather than uh, passing around um, platonic structures and propositions between people. Those are examples of language use that I think more people are comfortable with analyzing using a pragmatic vocabulary. Uh, I think pragmatists uh, want, a lot of them at least, want to expand the scope of that kind of analysis. Um, A a version of pragmatism that I think this is, you know, I'm getting at here is called uh, expressivism, where they want to see some kind of some speech act as being more like an expression, like Huzzah, and hooray, and fuck you. Do you think it's right that we overstate how much language is about conveying information? Because someone might hear hurrah and then say, okay, well, what yelling hurrah is about, this is like trying to convey the proposition that I am happy. But it seems like there's lots of cases where that's obviously not the case, where if I like scream at someone, run, like I'm not like, you know, maybe you want to argue like, okay, well, what I'm trying to convey is like, there is danger here. Mm -hmm. But that sort of sentence like never enters their mind. If I go yell at like a crowd of people run, they're just going to run. Like none of them are considering like, oh, okay. Like what he's trying to convey by run is like, there is danger here. And like, you know, this or that is going to be like most useful. Like there's actually just no other language going on in their head in response to a lot of these demands yeah and it sort of bypasses their like higher order representations in their brain goes straight to their running capacities exactly so do you think part of what pragmatism is getting at is that language is disproportionately it, it like actually a lot of what's useful about language is the stuff that bypasses concepts in our brain I think that might be, uh, insofar as concepts are supposed to be representations, that, that probably is something pragmatists would agree with. Um, I do think that there's, uh, it's plausible that we're too representationalist um, and we should be less representationalist. Uh, it's a little hard for me to say where the line should be. I don't know. I want to read more. I want to 
specifically, I'd like to read um, and understand the like archetypal example of representationalism in philosophy of language, where someone really just buys into the idea that language is about representing the world to see how far you can take it and see what the flaws are. And I'm referring to Ludwig Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. Um, it's a crazy text that is literally just like seven propositions and then a bunch of just comments and sub comments and sub sub comments on it. And uh, that is what he, he produced it when he was pretty young. And some people see it as sort of like the best example of this kind of all representation version of philosophy of language. And I feel like it would be helpful to actually know where the line should be drawn. Um, it would be helpful to see one of the best, try to do it, try to do it completely. Also, it's organized like, it's organized as if it were a really formal, almost mathematical uh, paper. And it ends with, uh, you know, where one cannot speak, one must remain silent. It ends with him telling you to, to like, shut up and stop confusing yourself with language, which is pretty cool. So uh, maybe I'll update you in the future about the, with more specifics about this. That seems like a good way to end any philosophy paper. Yeah. Telling your listeners to shut up and be less confused. Yeah. Stop asking so many dumb questions. So what, speaking of Wittgenstein's like taking seven axioms and then deducing from it, do you think bringing or what do you think the role of logic and deduction in philosophy should be? I know this is something Sellers talks about it or I mean, lots of philosophers talk about in terms of we're demanding too much out of philosophy when we, sh when we say it should parallel mathematics in having, you know, sure conclusions or everything being deductive. What, what do you think? Is the role of philosophy to give us certain truths? I think uh, deductive and really, really formal kind of um, argumentation and inference is probably useful when you're holding constant large-scale uh, features of your conceptual framework when you're arguing with people who basically want to use the same words to describe the same things and probably agree in deeper ways about how the world works. Um, within that relatively fixed framework, uh, it is useful to get that kind of clarity in argument because you're really asking, like, what can we do precisely using these tools? But a lot of progress in philosophy, um, and now I'm just directly stealing from Rorty, uh, comes from people just wholesale abandoning certain ways of talking about the world, just certain concepts. And that process, it doesn't really seem like you can motivate, um, you know, ceasing to talk about the soul or God uh, in, the, in the realm of philosophy of mind or ethics. It's hard to see any argument that brings you to that place, which is purely like deductive. Um, or purely logical. Um, you're kind of it's more like you offer, you're offering an alternative description of the world and an alternative vocabulary, and it's hard to motivate it in a logical sense. You just kind of say, try this new description on for size, and see if this helps you get around the world, uh, and see if this helps you, um, you know, have a generally more coherent world picture that is able to deal with new things like, you know, new advances in science and technology. Um, so, yeah, did we get progress in philosophy just because people happen to abandon their old views and then notice that their new views are better? That, that seems sort of, that seems difficult to like get philosophical progress to happen unless you can actually have really good arguments against the old views, you know? How do you get this adoption? Uh, it seems like it's parasitic on developments outside of philosophy um, in science, technology, and culture. Um, philosophy seems to be able... It seems useful for summarizing developments that are already happening in other parts of society and you know, maybe going ahead just a little bit, trying to see where the future will take us, um, trying to anticipate uh, 
where the intellectual world's going to be in like a hundred years. Um, but mostly you, you have to, you basically need things to, things to change usually in productive ways outside of philosophy, I think is, is how you get this kind of progress. Otherwise, uh, philosophers will, um, spend just, you know, interminable periods of time trading intuitions and, um, correcting each other's deductive arguments, uh, that use a fixed vocabulary, uh, and it just becomes kind of stale and boring eventually. So maybe then we should only have philosophers when there are large societal changes. Like we should just sort of fire most philosophers during regular periods of slow movement. And then, you know, once there's a bunch of like revolutions or changes in the world, we like hire, you know, hire a bunch of philosophers back and they help us cope with all the new information. Well, I sort of think when philosophers are useful, they kind of come up out of the woodworks. And I don't mean academic philosophers. I mean people who's, um, who are known for and whose job, basically, in society is doing something like philosophy. Um, like, so a typical example that Rorty gives of uh, philosophy being parasitic on cultural and technological developments is basically the Enlightenment and like the post scientific revolution intellectual work going on. The people who became big names in that period who articulated concepts, ideas like the scientific method and um, empiricism, just you know, experiment, hypothesis, the, the scientific like framework, um, you know, they weren't like professional philosophers. They were as I understand it, largely uh, rich people with time on their hands uh, who were curious about what was going on in the sciences and like wanted to explain this and um, wanted to see whether it, whether it challenged their old beliefs about God and then the church's authority and that kind of stuff. Um, so those people, I kind of, I feel like we don't have to do a lot of hiring and firing in philosophy. Yeah. A lot of the philosophy just sort of starts happening among people who are good at noticing things and have the time education to write down the things that they notice that makes sense but so you're obviously you got into philosophy you think like high quality things about the world you weren't like a random you know, rich person with too much free time on their hands so one how do we explain the fact that you got into philosophy and this you know model of philosophers being useful in the enlightenment and two how did you personally get into philosophy well, I am a random rich person who has too much free time. Uh, like, looking at a global <clears throat> scale, um, just the amount of leisure time that I was afforded uh, in college and beforehand, um, the fact that I was able to be in school uh, for, like, multiple decades. Um, so that was a source of opportunity for it. Uh, but I really, I really got into philosophy because me and... Um, wow, actually, this is kind of an example of what Rorty, what Rorty is saying about what motivates philosophy when you realize that your old vocabulary is not useful anymore for what you want to do. Um, I got into philosophy by arguing about ethics with other people who were raised Orthodox Jewish. Mm -hmm. And all of us were rather certain that the Orthodox Jewish framework um, was not going to help us in designing the perfect, the rational ethics, which would tell us what we should do in life and how we should treat each other. And so we were going to figure it out. Um, you know, on our own and by arguing about it and smoking weed. And uh, that's how I got into it, was basically arguing about ethical hypotheticals and um, concepts of, of good. Um, and that sort of also got me into philosophy of mind. Um, and it kind of, it's kind of expanded out from there. But for me, it yeah, really began uh, with ethics and trying to make my intuitions about how people should live and what I was right and wrong to do, trying to make them consistent and reasonable without appealing to the tools I was raised with to, to do that, which would be, you know, oh, it's reasonable and consistent because, um, you know, God told us to and because the Torah is God's word and so on and so forth. And it sounds like potentially also some of your intuitions differed with what you were taught, right? Yeah, I mean... It's sort of it's like one of the most obvious ones to us 
was just like sexual ethics and the whole, you know, being gay is a sin thing. Um, honestly, that's probably it. That's probably all you needed to make us all convinced that this was not going to be a, a fruitful like framework to use for ethics. Um, I mean, the framework also involves a bunch of like specific beliefs about how the universe was created and the existence of a, um, of a God who surprisingly has lots of human traits. Uh, you know, so we'd have the reasons to, to doubt it, that it was useful, but mainly like, it just seemed very obvious to us that, uh, being gay wasn't a sin, uh, it's just a sexuality and, uh, you know, we need something else to, to make sense of things. That's kind of awesome. You just noticed that <laughs> like, like society prog has progressed to the point where, even young people can tell that being gay isn't a sin, right? Like, and then you have this strong moral intuition and then you just debated with your, you know, friends who enjoyed debating for uh, mm -hmm. years, right? I, yeah, yeah. You know, and then do you feel like that project ever, what, what happened of that project? Was it like, okay, you debated it for like five years. You felt like you came to a satisfying conclusion. You moved to other parts of philosophy. You felt like it never came to a satisfying conclusion and you gave up on ethics having nice, like axiomatic foundations. What, how did that yeah. go? Well, my personal, my personal journey, um, in ethics didn't really end, but I do feel as if it's coming to a, a kind of conclusion, uh, so larger aspects of my ethical beliefs haven't changed for a while, but I still find it interesting to think about and argue about, um, the actual conversation with, with like my, my friends ended because we kind of just grew apart. Uh, and, and I think I, I think I, in that relationship at least died mad, uh, because I still disagreed with them about ethics. Uh, but like the, the, the state of uh, play at the time was, I think still then all being like hedonistic utilitarians. Um, and me being like, this is evil, uh, guys, guys, utilitarianism is evil. And then, not being able to explain uh, in a, in a non-dogmatic, not religious sounding way why utilitarianism is wrong. Um, and to be honest, I think that my like present views about ethics, um, which don't, in, in which I don't really see it as possible to uh, justify ethical beliefs the way you would justify um, scientific beliefs or mathematical beliefs as being much more connected to contingent facts about the human biology and things like preferences and attitudes, uh, that, that position, which sort of gives up on trying to formalize and justify my ethical intuitions all the way down, uh, comes out of being unable to do that, to like disprove utilitarianism. Um, you know, I knew I didn't like it and there were various hypotheticals involving utilitarianism where it suggested something that I thought was like, obviously evil and um people never... bit the bullet or and yeah well and I, I sort of just i bit the bullet on the entirety of the project of trying to make this like somehow logical and scientific um yeah that is funny how like personal attempts at disproving different parts of philosophy completely inform your meta views on like how that part of philosophy should be treated I, that, I feel like this is why I'm a relativist is just my inability to like find really clear arguments against the things that I think must be wrong. Yeah. I mean, wait, aren't you just describing coming to your views by reasoning about them? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that is coming to my views by, well, it, it's coming to my views by like noticing what I am or am not capable of. Right. Like that there's sort of a, oddly empirical piece maybe if I successfully argued like I had foolproof deductive arguments against like every single view I thought was wrong I would be a moral like I would be a you know truth absolutist I'd be like well no I just have the right views yeah um, but the fact that I can't do that makes me believe in rel you know re relativism broadly speaking significantly more so, yeah, it's interesting. We have sort of analogous views, uh, but you're just more of a you're more global about it. I am willing to talk about my ethical beliefs in a way that's friendly to relativism, um, and you're willing to talk about seemingly all of your beliefs 
in a way that's friendly to relativism. And uh, I feel like you talked about how you have difficulty giving like deductive, purely logical arguments in favor of of some beliefs you have, and then this leading you, like it led me with respect to ethics, to uh, sort of be like, yeah, you know, it just kind of makes sense to me, and that's the best I can say in in, in favor of it. It makes sense to me and coheres with the rest of the other things that I that I believe. Um, I feel like we just have different attitudes about where those arguments end. Um, like when you find yourself trying to uh, finally and completely justify, I don't know, some mathematical belief you have or some belief about logic. Uh, I still hold on to the idea that somehow the axioms I keep dogmatically referring to are the right ones to have. I can't, uh, I, I still can't drop this view that there's something intrinsically clear and reasonable about the uh, the basic beliefs I have that sort of inform my um, logic, you know, beliefs about what makes inferences good, and sort of also informs my like scientific worldview and my idea about like what makes good science and that sort of thing. Like I still think that the the, the propositions that I land on and feel unable to like further defend. But which are really key to under to, to you know to to justifying other beliefs, um, you know like law of non contradiction and you know a bunch of other basic abstract claims. Uh, yeah, they just still feel right to me in a way, that, right and objective somehow. You know, um, in a way that reasonable aliens should understand, no matter how alien they are, and uh, yeah. I, I like to believe the purest, the purest principle that I like to believe in is sort of non-contradiction. It's sort of just being consistent with yourself. And uh, I, wa- I, w- I would love it if that was the only thing I had to claim. You know, if sort of everything just fell out from there. That would know. be convenient. It, as it turns out, um, you know, just committing to being not self-contradictory uh, makes you a neoliberal. <laughs> Interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You don't even need that, to look at history and empirical data, actually. It falls right. out at a purely syntactic level. That's beautiful. I yeah. guess all the mathematicians who don't use the law of excluded middle are, I don't know, what are they? like? Communists? Commun- <laughs> they're communists. Exactly. For sure, yeah. A, a lot of topologists are accidentally communists. I, I like this. I'll inform them. Um, okay, something else I want to ask you about is Mary's room. This is like a famous philosophical thought experiment. I know we've discussed it before. I feel like your solution to the seeming problem is really good. So would you explain to us what Mary's room is and how you think about resolving it? This is funny because you told me you were going to ask about Mary's room. And I was like, well, obviously, this is finally my chance to look at things I've written about it and where I've tried to make like a clear introduction, you know. And practice them. And I thought, nah, I'm sure we won't get to Mary's room. You know, we'll be talking about other stuff. And here we are. Here we are, Elliot. We made it. I'm reaping what, I'm, what I've sown. <laughs> uh, so Mary's room is a philosophical thought experiment um, intended to present a problem for physicalism, um, which itself kind of needs definition. Yeah, what is physicalism? Good question. Physicalism is the view that everything is physical. Mm-hmm. Um, so in particular, there, there's no soul because a soul would would be some ephemeral yeah. thing. Okay. To be honest, and here's a definition of physicalism I actually like, but I admit this doesn't make it immediately obvious how it's being used in Mary's room. But the version of physicalism that I like as a definition is just the claim that... Um, one, everything, all like features of the universe, truths about our universe, are somehow dependent on, uh, sort of explained by, um, truths that you could articulate in the language of fundamental physics. If you had enough data and also like a completed theory of physics, you would sort of be able to explain everything that goes on. Um, you know, maybe not everything all at once, but at least, you know, local, when you localize some system and you're like, why is it doing this? You could give an explanation if you had this complete theory of physics. Physicalism is, is that 
plus the claim that that complete theory of physics is not going to make mention of and will not need to appeal to um, mind, soul, God, spirit, etc. Uh, but, but like specifically to mind, um, to things like experiences, feelings, um, thoughts, intentions, desires. Uh, physicalism in this view is, is kind of just a form of reductionism about um, mental things, basically. It's the view that, uh, you know, we're just made out of the same stuff everything else is made out of, and we do things because of because of that stuff and that stuff to describe it completely, to, to explain how it behaves. Um, you know, you just have to do physics, and you don't have to just assume that there is uh, some, like, fundamental kind of um, mentality or spirituality in the universe to explain things. Um, and yeah. so a, a student of history is probably going to say, okay, well, you know, science has done a really, really good job at explaining more and more things. Like originally the scope of science was limited, you know, maybe, you know, 2000 years ago to yeah. like Dope, fate tools, kids. <laughs> that was a good interlude. This episode is sponsored by Jewel. <laughs> this episode is sponsored by the Monsanto Chemical Company. <laughs> I feel like I'll cut that part out. That was You'll funny. cut that part out. Yeah. And, and where I said Jewel. This episode is sponsored by defense contractors and the concept of rent seeking. That's pretty good. I mean, if there were rent seekers, we couldn't fund this podcast. No. Um, okay. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So a student of, of the history of science is going to say, okay, um, science has increasingly explained more and more of the world, right? So it started with maybe being able to talk about water, fire, air, and earth, you know, a couple of thousand years ago. Yeah. And it seems like the scope of science has expanded more and more. So probably there was some point at which people were like, okay, I mean, science can explain a lot, but there's no way science ever explains clouds. Like clouds are just like, they're just like way out there. There are these poofy things. They're just like very different than like anything else we interact with in our day-to-day -day life. Like, you know, the scope of, you know, science will explain a lot, but it'll never get clouds. And then obviously like every time someone says something like that, it turns out like clouds are fundamentally, you know, made of the other sort, sort of stuff that we do understand. And you just get this, you know, you, you do get different properties in different contexts, but ultimately science seems pretty capable of explaining everything. Mm -hmm. So can you explain why someone would want to argue against this in the first place? Like what's the idea, you know, I, like people who think that the mind is special are aware of the history of science. They know that science has increasingly explained things. So like what, why might someone expect that the mind is one of the first times that science will actually fail to increase its scope of expansion? I think uh, it's a conceptual issue. Um, we we have this we have these concepts of the concept of an experience and certain kinds of experiential qualities. Um, the the classic one being color, uh, color perception, uh, redness, pure redness, um, which unlike a lot of other concepts we have don't seem to relate that much to what things do. Uh, when you say something is, um, you know, this, that I'm experiencing a, uh, a smell of lavender, it doesn't seem like you're really committing to um, much that's sort of mechanistic or behavioral. Um, sometimes this is also called functional. Uh, you're sort of just using this, this predicate, like, is lavendery? Uh, that's like purely qualitative and which we don't really have much other concepts to um, define it in terms of. Uh, we don't have a lot to say about what it means to be lavendery um, or red, except in terms of other qualitative concepts, which it has some degree of like similarity to. Unlike saying that something is a chair, which um, involves committing to it being useful in certain ways, um, and being able to undergo certain processes that you can describe in uh, you know third personal terms 
um, you know, being able to support weight, for instance, maybe having a certain size, roughly. Uh, these these other concepts, the, the the concepts we use to understand private mental episodes, are uh, seem to resist being explained in other terms, and um, those terms. So, and that challenges that seems to pose a challenge for um, explaining how things like experience of red come about, uh, because it's not obvious how you would tell a story uh, which uses basically scientific, naturalistic vocabulary, whether it's chemistry or biology, computation or fundamental physics. It's not clear how you would tell a story that uses just those terms and then comes to a point where you say, ah, and therefore uh, that's why the experience of red manifests. You know, when this ensemble of computations occurs, that's why uh, there's a thing which says that I'm experiencing red now. Um, Truly, like right, right. Maybe you can explain why, like, our tongues waggle in a certain way to produce sounds, which we translate as, you know, I'm experiencing red, um, because you know, waggling is one of those concepts that you can, uh, and even tongue is one of those concepts that you can uh, explain and, and reduce to more uh, naturalistic terms, functional terms. Um, it's not obvious how you could ever tell a story which, like, makes sense of. Facts like I'm having this experience. I'm seeing this uh, flash of red. Uh, but it's also not, you know, people people say, oh, this shows that, you know, experiential concepts, qualitative concepts, can't be reduced to physical terms. To you know, can't be um, defined in terms of computations or uh, ke- chemical interactions or something like that. But like to be clear, they also can't be defined in terms of anything else. You can't explain um, what pure visual redness is in terms of you know in artistic terms, really, or in um, you know ordinary vocabulary in terms of chairs and tables or windows, uh, like or other sensory modalities. Um, you know, like using smells to define redness. There's a lot of associations. Between them, things that are red tend to smell a certain way, maybe. So you can sort of point someone in the direction of the color experience you're talking about. Um, but it doesn't seem like you can really define it in, in any other terms, uh, like what, you know, pure redness is. Uh, not just physical terms, it's like all terms. These concepts seem to be, um, you know, closed, conceptually closed in their own little circle uh, from which you can't escape. And, um, it's not, you know, physical, con- scientific concepts aren't unique in being unable uh, to uh, sort of explain what they mean. It's like all of them. So, yeah. So what is Mary's Room? Maybe it's a good time to explain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what is Mary's Room? Yeah, Mary's Room is, uh, so it's trying to present an issue for physicalism. Uh, but really, I think what it's doing is just, it's a way of bringing people's attention to the uh, this, like, closed conceptual world of sensory terms like redness uh, though it, it's it's oriented around the experience of red and like the red experience concept but it could have been um produced for other um sensory terms uh and it's calling people's attention to this by basically saying can you possibly imagine explaining to anyone um what it means <laughs> For something to be read without just doing brain surgery on them to make sure that they actually are able to see red like we do. Imagine someone whose name is Mary, who is some kind of giga scientist who's really capable of just absorbing and understanding the content of all physics, chemistry, computation, mathematical, etc. textbooks in the world, um, but who's colorblind. Uh, it seems quite reasonable to assume that there could exist someone who is colorblind, but could understand those textbooks uh, just as well as any scientist who wrote them can. Um, but it sure doesn't seem possible for us to teach uh, Mary what uh, really like qualitative red actually means. It feels like she she wouldn't really understand it until she actually just experienced red herself, even if she read the textbooks that like, related to color vision. Um, and neuroscience and stuff like that. As long as she was colorblind the whole time, 
Um, it seems like she'd still be missing something. Another way of putting that is if you fixed her color blindness, that's ableist. Um, if you changed her color blindness so that she was no longer colorblind, uh, it seems probable that she would tell you, wow, this is new. Yeah. That's interesting. Oh, that's what red looks like. Yes. Uh, you know, she might say, I've learned something that I didn't, that I didn't know before. Um, and this is despite having read every single thing there is to read on the color red. Yeah. Like the, the intuition that this is trying to pump is that, uh, colorblind people are missing something. There's something they don't know or understand a concept they don't, they can't really use yet. Uh, and which you couldn't fix by having them read textbooks, uh, you need to change something at the hardware level in their brain and then have them have a, a new experience. So that seems potentially bad, right? If for the project of science, like I just gave Mary every single possible scientific textbook on red and she still doesn't know what red looks like. So does that mean science is doomed to not be able to explain the color red? I think science is trying to help predict and control the universe and science can help you build the machine that gives you color vision that changes your brain so that you do so you are able to you know understand what the color vision people are saying with red uh and um you know you want if you wanted to be able to figure out what this word really means just by reading if that's what you thought science's purpose was and that it fails otherwise then uh too bad for you uh in my view um but w yeah. what does this tell us about whether or not red is physical? Yeah, so this is supposed to help us disprove the idea that red is physical uh, and, and, and disprove physicalism. Um, you know, I, I said that physicalism is the view that you can explain everything using the tools of physical sciences, which, which don't refer to you know, mentality and to mind and experiences. But it seems like I've also just said that you can't actually explain what red is or means um, without uh, using, using that vocabulary. And uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, this reveals that I've used two different senses of explain uh, to talk about this. I certainly think you can't define what red means. Um, you can't get someone to understand what red means just by teaching them things, passing them sentences, you know, in the language of physics. Um, but physics and neuroscience and computational science can give you the tools to explain how to build people, people who can see redness. And uh, to me, that seems like, uh, you know, sufficient explanation for what I was going for in my definition of physicalism. Um, why should we expect that the uh, why should we expect that the concepts of physics and chemistry can define all the concepts? Um, but a lot of people. You know, especially before people were talking about Mary's room that much, that was pretty much what they thought physicalism entailed. Um, you can clarify all language and understand everything if you read the complete physics textbook and understand it. Um, and uh, I guess I'm okay with dropping that as a requirement for what physicalism, uh, for physicalism to be true. And it seems like there's a difference between being a failure of language and being a failure of science. Like, it seems like Mary Shroom can tell us that indeed, you know, lang all of language, including all possible scientific language, is insufficient to getting a colorblind person to, like, truly know everything about red, including what it looks like. But... It seems like science could still tell us how to help Mary see red, right? By like doing something, you know, by doing a particular brain surgery, say. So what, like science can still get all knowledge about red in Mary's brain, right? Like 
maybe that's all we should care about. So there's going to be a bunch of it which you can get by like giving her textbooks. And there's going to be some of it which you can only get by like, you know, stimulating her brain in a really particular way that like language just doesn't have access to. And that seems like it doesn't tell us much about, you know, to what extent the world is physical. It just tells us that there are parts of the brain that can't be accessed by language. What, what do you think of that distinction? I mean, I do think this is showing a problem with language, the, the conceptual closure of the qualitative concepts. This is kind of a claim about language. Um, I think that's probably a good way to put it. Um, and it motivates denying f- that physicalism is true, honestly, in the way that I initially described it. Because the way I initially described it was in terms of language. I said that the language of physics or chemistry or computation or whatever is going to explain everything, everything that's true, everything that's knowable. And it seems like that's just not, it turns out not to be true. Uh, the language of physics isn't going to explain everything. Um, and I think that the difficult thing is that what you want to do, uh, being a physicalist, is make a metaphysical or ontological claim. Like, everything that exists is completely composed of basically the things we're talking about with physics. And all actual events that occur, all structures that exist, are somehow agglomerations of and modifications of those things that we talk about in physics. And... um, so there's this. So everything that exists is, you want to say, explained by physics. But what we really mean is that, like, everything that exists is, like, composed of and built up of uh, the things that we talk about in physics, you know, quantum fields or uh, particles and stuff like that. And uh, it's hard to, it's natural to cash that out as a linguistic claim by saying that, like, all true sentences can be defined. Uh, or perfectly interpreted using sentences that just use the language of physics. Uh, but I guess that's wrong. I guess that's what it's showing us um, in Mary's room and these concerns about um, language and the inscrutability of these, of these concepts. It turns out that to acquire, to learn some things, um, to acquire some knowledge, you need to have brain surgery. Uh, and you can't just read. Saying it that way, it sounds fine. <laughs> it right? does sound fine, right? Why should uh, yeah? Why should being uh, why should believing everything is made of quantum fields or whatever the yeah. physicists tell us? Why should that imply that everything that is knowable can be known by uh, reading? Right. That yeah. that just totally depends on your brain architecture. Yeah. In a yeah. way that whether everything is made of quantum fields doesn't. Yeah. There's some there's some things that you only pick up uh, by uh, yeah getting brain surgery yeah hardware matters I completely agree um, I admit though like yeah. in favor of the people who are really into Mary's room as an argument against physicalism this does motivate me to change what I mean by physicalism the I really like the definition I initially told you right where I used the word explain a lot and didn't explain uh, what I meant by that uh, and. I find myself having to revise it and not really uh, commit to this claim um, anymore when I'm thinking about Mary's room stuff. And I have a open, if I claim to be a physicalist, I should have a better explanation of it. Um, you know, maybe I've said enough by talking about what things are composed of. This is kind of like almost like a, you know, construction, construction claim, muriological claim, maybe. I don't know. Uh, it's kind it's of arguable that I haven't done enough to explain it by just talking about that. And that's interesting. It's yeah. also interesting that this is one of the few times where composed of isn't synonymous to like explainable out of. I feel like usually when like e- even in physics, when we want to say that like something more complex is composed of you know, multiples of something smaller, like what we're actually doing is we're saying that this like bigger complex thing, its behavior is best explained by positing that there's a bunch of smaller things 
that interact in some like, um, you know, I guess, yeah, more easy to understand way that can then shed light on what this whole big system is doing. Like, you, you know, the reason we went from, okay, well, atoms are the base unit to electrons, neutrons. What's the third one? <laughs> protons? <laughs> protons. I was yeah. going to say positrons. Uh, that's, that's embarrassing for my career as a scientist. Yeah. Um, electrons, neutrons, protons are composing an atom. R- really what's going on is that if you want to fully explain the behavior of an atom, well, you could, if you wanted, right? When we shot a bunch of particles at atoms and saw that like sometimes they were deflected in odd ways, what you could say is, okay, well, the atom is still just one big thing. It's not made of anything else. And it just has this funny property that like it, you know, it repels, even though on average it's electrically neutral, like it repels, you know, positively charged things differently than negatively charged things, something like this. Um, you know, it, you could just posit that. But instead we say, okay, well, let's make the atom be made up of smaller things because that's like, that's the simplest way to explain its big behavior. Yeah. So we sort of, I don't know if we have a good concept of what it means to be made up of smaller things other than, well, you're best explained by these smaller things. So if we want to say everything is actually made up of physical constituents, like I I guess it's not even clear how we would test that or what that's supposed to get at if we lose this explanation relationship. Yeah, it does seem hard to explain where red comes from i've actually okay i love uh yosha bach and he's given a bunch of talks where he uh says a mix of like really true seeming awesome things and then sort of uh somewhat confusing uh trippy things uh and does it very quickly and he says it like it's kind of obvious sometimes i love yosha bach um he tries to talk he, he he talks about how experience and or he says consciousness usually is um is a simulation and it's like he tries to offer sort of oblique explanations of experience or of you know, the quality red uh you know maybe one way you can explain redness or something like that is uh that you can ask why would it be useful for evolution for evolutionary purposes for for my brain to make me think that uh or to maybe have an experience like this to give me a concept like this maybe i can't define the concept in terms of ordinary concepts but i can explain what use my like organism gets out of having a concept like this um you know, it's and kind what, of what explanation. use does your organism get for having an experience of red? Well, why is having "quote unquote" inner experiences useful? Well, to be honest, I don't really know. Uh, maybe, maybe it's useful for you want to model your world, but you also need to model an inner world because sometimes you make mistakes, and you need to explain the process by which you make certain mistakes and perhaps uh, representing your inner world as having these analogs for external world properties. You know, it's not, it's not red light. It's pure redness. You know, maybe that helps you tell the story of how it is that you came to know what you know, and especially how it helps you diagnose error. It's like, Oh, I thought that mistakenly that the ball was red, because I had this pure redness experience, which typically correlates with, you know, things outside in the world being red. And, um, you know, perhaps qualia concepts, quality, experiential quality concepts, they're like building blocks of this inner world picture, which is useful for diagnosing like perceptual error. Maybe. Interesting. Qu- well, last question before break, I-, I guess, is on this point, which is... Why have a sense of self in our inner world modeling at that point? If the entire point of 
having this sort of reflexive experience is to be able to diagnose errors in perception, then why not just have like a me watching the computer that is like the rest of my mind, right? And you know, like why why have my experiences around me like feel like feel like something special to me? Like why why do they have to feel like experiences instead of, you know, me just watching things play out like that, you know, as my brain is doing perception. Did that make sense? Well, in this, you know, half-baked explanation I'm giving of yeah. consciousness, uh, that is what's happening. You're, you, know, you, you coming to the view that you are having a red experience is your, com- you know, is one computer looking at the activities of another computer. And it just so happens that the way it breaks up the activities of your perceptual system is into chunks like a red experience and a blue experience. Um, this is just, these are representations that it's employed uh, in the process of monitoring its own perception. So they are the same thing. Okay. I kind of like this model. This could be right. Break? Sure, yeah. Digital worlds. I've heard of them. There have there's all these fucking MMORPGs and just really immersive giant digital universes where people tons of people are spending tons of their time and there's all these uh, artifacts and server logs and databases storing all of the information um, and it's like it's like it feels like humanity is producing more history per second uh, than ever before and so much of it is happening in these digital worlds. And I'm just interested in this idea of history in these worlds. Um, I don't have like a particular thesis. I have like one thesis that relates to a specific digital world, uh, but I'm just generally interested in how like the concept of history does and doesn't apply to them. Um, In some sense it, it doesn't because any state can be frozen and saved forever for all time you can go back to uh you know like open open up some map or some like thing that was created did some digital asset that was created decades ago and it doesn't change and in theory you can just save everything every single moment of like if you're interested in the history of this like blog thing and like people are role-playing together you know doing a homoerotic harry potter fan fiction every single moment of that can be saved forever so it's kind of like a treasure trove of history and makes history like perfect perfectible almost but also there's so much information that it's hard to imagine someone really doing this like there's too much information almost the archives are now like too well stocked uh and i'm so curious about how people historians will be trying to work on this later um what the process of trying to make histories of different digital worlds will be like. Um, I just think that's very cool. But specifically, there's this one digital world. Uh, It's a Minecraft server that's been running for like almost 20 years or something like that. Um, And it's called 2B2T. Uh, I don't know why. And it's basically Minecraft in survival mode. So like, you don't really have magic god powers and you can die randomly. Um, and, uh, it's been, there's like one spawn, rough spawn region where people who come into the game, they, they will spawn there unless they have like a bed maybe somewhere else. I don't know exactly how Minecraft works. And, uh, it's been going on for like almost 20 years and there's all these different like stories, uh, of different events that happened in 2B2T history lore. And I've been listening to these videos that discuss it, um, on YouTube. There's a guy named FitMC. Who is in fact fit, he, and he talks about the uh, the, the history of the uh, largest anarchy server in Minecraft, and um, so it's called an anarchy server because it's there's basically no rules uh, about how players have to interact with each other. You can get banned for like trying to hack, uh, maybe for using some exploits or glitches, but it's kind of like open world, do whatever you want. You can kill each other, you can destroy things, and you can grieve things. You can, if you find a base, you can just start destroying it if you'd like. And um, 
as it relates to history, this this place is interesting because there it's closer to the real world. Um, there's there's something more like real time in two B two T. Like I mentioned, how you know you can make digital worlds where people are walking around and doing things, and everything is saved forever, and the environment is immutable and never degrades and never changes. But 2B2T isn't like that. The environment is mutable. You can change things. You can destroy things. And, um, and like, unless someone goes out of their way to, like, save it, and it's, like, a huge server, so you can't do it for the whole thing, really, uh, stuff can just be lost. So there's, like, active archivists and historians who are really interested, not, like, academic ones, just players, who, um, when they find, like, ancient, old bases that have been undiscovered until now will go and quickly uh, like save a local copy of that like chunk of the Minecraft world and um, and basically because and the reason they're doing it is because they're worried people are going to come destroy it and there's you know griefers are like this general term for people who go around destroying stuff and they're everywhere but they're and they're kind of awful and you want to hate them especially if you hear you hear about them destroying some like beautiful ridiculous minecraft creation that somehow someone made in survival mode but the presence of griefers in this digital world actually make um basically time real in that world because they destroy stuff they make like time's passage actually mean something in 2b2t because of the possibility of being destroyed by griefers and the whole it's possible to uncover old bases and really feel like you're walking into ancient history because it's actually true that in the intervening history it could have been destroyed the whole time and it makes it like more dramatic and interesting and like actually discovering you know hidden um you know villages ancient mesopotamian villages in the real world and I find it, I find it interesting. It's like there's this, there's this like form of di- understanding time as like this form of uh, disorder and the possibility of destruction, uh, or maybe history as sort of intervals of time during which things could have been destroyed but weren't. It had like persist through it. Um, I find that I find that interesting. Uh, it's like this alternate sort of digital version of time and history, and also uh, it sort of presents a moral question. Which is like, do you hate the griefers or do you have to love them? Must you appreciate them because they actually make this world what it is? Without them, it wouldn't matter that a base has survived for 19 years. It, you know, it, it wouldn't matter that someone was able to actually, even for like a month, create a ridiculous giant tower very close to spawn where things are liable to be destroyed. Um, the, the griefers actually make objects and artifacts in that universe have a history and have a incredible value um and so it's sort of an interesting little like conundrum I mean, you don't fall either way on either hitting them or loving them but it's um i just i just find it super interesting and i kind of i personally love hate the griefers my, myself and um yeah what do you think totally. about that yeah i, I mean there's an entire camp that basically says what makes the present valuable is that the past is lost, right? Like what, why I'm me today and why I, you know, can care a lot about the experiences around me is that I can't remember all of it. Like I had better appreciate it now because it will go away. Like, you know, I only get some really, really small selection of my experiences to remember. And even then, memories are worse than the real thing. And, you know, memories get modified and fade away over time if I get lucky enough to even have it stored in memory in the first place. Yeah. Like, they're so... Yeah. Like, the present's valuable because it's unique, yeah, in the, a sense. It, like, well, and, and it's, like, by far the most real. Um, you have so much... Yeah, you have so much access to it. Whereas, and I think people are concerned that with, you know, perfect, uh, I don't know, 3D camera imaging of like all of your surroundings, like people are going to get distracted getting perfect copies of all of their experiences to store forever and never actually appreciate the experiences that they have. Like, this, you know, this is a classic thing where it's like you are you have the most beautiful world view in the world. Why are you looking at your camera screen instead of the view itself um and i think 
maybe something is lost if you gain the ability to preserve. Like the yeah. fact that something is going away makes it more special. Maybe to life in general, maybe just to the present. Like that, there, there seems to be something real there. And this Minecraft like case study is like such an interesting example of that where, you know, there's so much more excitement that can come because you find some really cool hidden base like that hasn't been destroyed yet. Like it's valuable because there's the chance mm -hmm. or even like, you know, you know, it will get destroyed at some point, but it's here now. So you like appreciate it more. Yeah. I, I people make this argument, um, arguments like this. I think there might've been like Martha Nussbaum, someone, I read a paper of hers where she was recanting her old views where she was like, immortality is bad because then nothing has value. Because mm -hmm. it's like, I guess, you know, you can always go back to a place or you could always, you know, your moment now, your year of life now doesn't matter because you have an infinite number of them in the future. Um, and I always found those so annoying, like these arguments. Yeah. Where, and she was recanting it in this paper um, where she was, I think, cause I think she was complaining about also how like an infinite timeline, you can't like have a narrative structure that c encompasses the whole thing. There's no like... I mean, I guess you can't really have an infinite story, I guess is the idea. Um, it wouldn't have the right dramatic beats. You couldn't describe falling and rising action in a way that is as meaningful as in normal finite stories. Uh, and then, you know, in recanting it, she was saying, well, you can just have lots of little stories, you know, something like that. And I kind of agree with that. And I really don't like being told that immortality would be bad, actually. It sounds like cope uh, from people who are going to die. And... Um, but admittedly, at least when it comes to things that aren't me, you know, like a base in Minecraft, uh, I'm very, I'm sort of happy that all the things that are on 2 b 2 t are immortal, um, you know, as long as they're not me, because of this thing. I don't know if it's quite the same as, you know, it, they would be less valuable because, you know, they're going to be around forever. I mean, uh, basically, uh, basically it's exactly it. <laughs> it's also the idea of resistance. You know, something is valuable mm. because not only because it won't be around forever, but because it's sort of being it, fought be, against. It being around was something that had to um, that could only happen because of uh, you know being yeah being fought for active preservation or lots of coincidences, which is also interesting. It's like it's a miracle, you know, that it's here. You can have miracles in the two B two T world because of that. And how, how does this relate to EVE Online? Oh. I think that was just another example of a digital world which has, like, a ridiculously, like, rich, complicated history. Uh, I don't actually know as much about it, relatively speaking, as, as 2P2T. But it was just uh, a sort of example of... That's also, I think, an open world thing where people can destroy objects and destroy each other. Um, but it's not quite... It's not quite the same vibe, but it is It is just an example of, like, modern digital history. Like, there are actual... There's, like, this five-and-a-half-hour-long YouTube video explaining, like, the history of EVE Online. And it's... Uh, that's a lot of content. It's a lot of stuff happening there. And, you know, sometimes I want to know... What, how would the world be different if I could see it in terms of if I could lift the veil that separates normal, you know, legal activities and like the underworld? Like, do you how much does the underworld and crime like really determine how things happen in this world? And I feel like we're not we're not quite there yet where EVE Online or um, really any game like actually matter at like a geopolitical level. But it is crazy to think about how much of just humanity is in like their real projects. What they're really invested in are these digital worlds. And, um, you know, it makes me, it makes me feel almost, I, I really want to know about them. I want to know more of these histories. And, um, although I don't know if I really want to get involved in the worlds, <laughs> I just, but I feel a sense of like all this, all this data, you know, all these, all these dramas, uh, that I'm missing that I could learn more of um, and EVE Online is just a kind of pretty extreme example of them as far as, as, far as a long lasting and like intricate digital world that like takes over people's lives 
And it's kind of interesting that for thousands of years, the most interesting human communities had to do with place. Like every historian is going to say like, oh, you know, the the London coffee shop intellectual scene, right? Like the, yeah. the type of community you care about, like has to do with, you know, a college campus or, or a place like, and probably going forward, the most important communities in the world are going to be online ones, right? Yeah. Do, do you think you that's the case? Like of- how does that change f- future history? Well, they're not the most important, but they are still important. Like it just so it just is the case now that if you want to do an intellectual history of the two thousands, you have to talk about Tumblr and 4chan, probably, and Reddit, uh, probably, <laughs> uh, and yeah. Now we have a new kind of uh, place. It's like it motivates like an abstracted sense of place where like what makes the the space is now it's like causal interaction space. Uh, um, instead, you're still you're still finding you know interesting things for histories historians to look at are still places, but they're like dense networks of uh, causal interaction that is like relatively um, non lossy. People can easily interact with each other through these different media, and that makes them a place because there's you know there's like few, very few nodes between them and each other. Essentially, you know, just log on to Twitter. Um, what is space anyway? True. Ask Chase that question. <laughs> Maybe uh, that would be incredible if there's some good sense in which, like, everyone in a Discord chat has a wormhole between them, you know? So, yeah. that, so like, the right way to write, you know, the geodesics or curvature of space <laughs> is is actually, like, everyone, you know, in a group chat right now, like, is is actually physically together. Yeah. You can make black hole analogs too, probably. Mess- place where messages never get out from. <laughs> Twitter? They can go into it, but they never get out. <laughs> Twitter comments section? Yeah, these days. Now, most of the, so many of the woke people have left and the companies. Wh- which companies? Oh, just like normal companies. Twitter is more of a black hole, I think, because lots of people from the more mainstream have left it, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, you could do gravity, you could do all sorts of things. Yeah. Seems right. Beautiful online intellectual culture we've built. Yeah. Okay, Elliot, it's time for me to rant about uh, grocery shopping. Okay. <laughs> What's the deal with grocery shopping? Well, really, you know, you asked me uh, this week what I would like to talk about. Yeah. What ideally, what conversation topic of mine would somehow go viral was the idea. Seems a little presumptuous there. (laughs) I wasn't making any promises. I was just, you know. But um, I, uh, you know, I basically said I would love it if me complaining about some aspect of modernity, which I'm normally thinking about quietly, um, would go viral. You know, because that resonates with with the every man and it's about something something new you know uh people have been arguing about the physical world versus the mental world and language for uh, hundreds thousands of years but you know retail grocery stores are a somewhat new phenomenon in the world and um yeah they basically i i find i find uh I have an adversarial relationship with marketing generally. Why? Like, can, can I steal man marketing for a moment? Because I personally had a distaste for marketing for a long time and have yeah. recently come to appreciate it. Yeah, go ahead. Like, okay. Yeah. I, I think there's a giant matching problem in society between people and with you know preferences that they have that they may or not may or may not know that they have, and like the products and services that people create. Like in general, if you create something new and it's going to be really useful to like 0.1% of the population, it's really, really, really hard to connect yourself with that 0.1% of the population. And the role of marketing, the role of like the entire advertising industry is correctly showing the people who would like would enjoy or want this product or service that it exists and that they can access it. 
Because I think there's a lot of stuff out there that I like could make my life better or has made my life better that I just wouldn't have known about if I didn't get it advertised to me. And in general, like now that I'm more on the you know, business side of things, I see tons of cases where people create like really, really cool, interesting new ideas. And then if they had to go spread by word of mouth, like that they created this awesome product, it would be impossible. It would never take off. They'd never find their end user. But instead, like the entire marketing advertising industry, which, you know, is basically solving this matching problem of like preference satisfiers to preference havers. What, what do you think of that model? I mean, the kind of marketing that really bothers me is uh, I'm usually I'm getting marketed to usually by firms who are selling products like I already know about. Okay. And, um, you know, it, it absolutely serves a function. I wouldn't I'm not actually against marketing and mass advertising. It just makes me feel existentially unwell and uh, inhuman. Um you know, the experience of passing by a billboard for McDonald's, which they try to tempt you with their, you know, red and yellow color scheme and mm, 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 and other <laughs> little catchphrases, giant high def pictures of salty food that's bad for you. Uh, I feel like an animal and I feel, uh, you know, I'm imagining the perspective of the advertiser, right? Uh, in their perspective, I'm just this like tiny unit consumer in a vast teething swarm of people uh, who could who, whose whose existence to them whose relevance to them is our capacity to consume their product and pay them money so I'm like being you know when I look at these billboards I feel tiny I feel like a uh, just one of the masses reduced down to my like capacity to consume and what's also you know, the way I'm also being represented in the mind of the advertiser, or rather in my representation of the mind of the advertiser as I watch the billboards, is I'm being represented in terms of my weaknesses and, um, you know, my anxieties, the desires that I have that I have little control over. They're trying to make me crave something or addict me to something. And they're trying to um, basically... Uh, exploit all of my weaknesses and um, exploit the sort of lower order. They, they want to exploit my, my laziness. This is part of why I also, it hurts, hurts me being in like grocery stores because the things that have the best marketing are usually the things that are the least good in terms of as products. They, they're like the version of this cleaning product, which, you know, really lazy, ignorant college students buy because they don't know how to like sustainably and cheaply clean and cook and that kind of stuff. So the money gets put into like the marketing and playing up how convenient it is. And I feel like I walk through the halls of the grocery stores and they're extremely bright and I'm bombarded everywhere by attempts to make me like a worse version of myself, sort of. Um, to make me give in to my laziness and my impulses and, um, you know, and the, 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 uh, the overall effect of it is I feel, I feel like the advertisers, the companies, they have contempt for me. They, I read advertisements in a tone of, of contempt or sort of a background uh, voice who's, you know, reading off the advertisement, but then in the background is saying, ah, oh, yeah, you'll like that, won't you? You fucking idiot. We heard you stupid millennials like pastel colors. We put some pastel in there. You like that? You like your chicken nuggies, huh? You want to get some of your tendies? We'll make it easy for you, you fucking moron. You don't know what things you should buy. You're scared of learning stuff. Don't learn stuff. Just, just buy this easy thing and learn as little as possible. It's depressing. Grocery stores are depressing as fuck. You see people buying the stuff that also is like lower value and uh, unhealthy. And, you know, it's very, I'm being judgmental. I'm judging them, their purchase decisions, um, you know, and that's unpleasant to feel. It's like I'm watching the contemptuous advertisers win, win over the hearts and minds and keep, and keep us all sort of, you know, more infantilized. Uh, less capable of taking care of ourselves in an efficient way. Um, 
and uh, yeah, I just I just find it it's depressing. It's all these open attempts to manipulate you and appeal to the parts of your character that are kind of weak and appeal to your uh, to your ignorance, and um, it hurts me. And to do this, you know, they must have contempt for us. If I were, I imagine myself being, uh, you know, working in marketing in one of these giant corporations and just talking about how best to manipulate the average consumer, you know, and I would have complete contempt for myself in this position, uh, you know, talking about how to manipulate me, um, how to hide, how to hide that we're shrinking the package sizes, <laughs> you know, but keeping the, the price constant, how to hide how we're using lower quality materials. It's like, it's like a, a war and I'm just trying not to get fucked over constantly. And, um, and yeah, it makes me sad. I don't know what ennui means, but I feel like it's a word someone would say at this point. I th- think it's a town in France, but it probably means something else. Unrelated to this word, I don't know. <laughs> that seems right. That, <laughs> in some sense, right? There's you know, there's the rational, civilized side of each of us. There's the more primal side of each of us. For a lot of companies, the only people who can buy their products are the ones whose primal side has taken over. And it's the job of the advertising, marketing, the setup in the grocery stores, whatever it is, to like unleash that, you know, take down all your defenses and unleash this less civilized side of you who will eat like pancakes and syrup for every breakfast. Or those craft uh, like noodle bowl things. They're so easy. I've eaten so many of them. They're like instant mac and cheese yeah. from Kraft. Those things, you, know, you make them and you just feel like you're eating plastic, but they're so good. They taste so good and they're so easy and all their bright and beautiful colors. And they're using aesthetics and beauty and art and like lots of genuinely smart people who are really good at design to get me to eat their like 10,000 gram sodium yeah. Meal. It's war thing. propaganda. <laughs> yes, yes, it's war propaganda. We are in a war, and they're on the side of my most lazy, stupid, anxious, insecure self. Uh, and they're winning. Elliot, I'll tell you. They're winning. Yeah. Yeah. Alas. Are you ever happy after you eat one of the instant Kraft mac and cheese bowls? Or it's always regret? Well, to be honest, when I ate those, my experience eating those uh, is mostly um, in college and normally uh, I'm not in a completely sober state of mind. So I'm pretty much left uh, quite satisfied, actually. Uh, I really enjoy those experiences. I look back on them fondly. So maybe it's not too bad of war then. (laughs) Uh, That's really funny. Okay. Unrelated to grocery stores, potentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm very curious. I mean, w- one way of phrasing this is like, what do you feel like the biggest lessons that other people should hear are? Another way of phrasing this is like, you know, given everything you know now, what would you want to tell a younger version of yourself? I feel like this this is like a really good question for teasing out the insights people have that are broadly useful to others. Oh, uh, I would say don't smoke weed and don't get into jewels, uh, tobacco products. Um, you have not that great self-control and, um, you know, you're going to use them too much. But more broadly, uh, major in math uh, and then just take fun classes on the side and then you'll be able to get lots of jobs. You know, make sure you know a programming language and just prove you're smart with a math degree and then you can do lots of things. There's no need to waste your time doing, uh, you know, like business school for a couple of years just so you can get a job later, you know. Just just, just do math. Use that as the uh, skill-proof aspect of your degree and then do like, take philosophy classes or like econ classes or whatever it is your, uh, you know, interests are on the side. It'll be more efficient. So it's use math for its signaling aspect 
and then take whatever classes you're actually going to enjoy or be useful yeah. on the side. I, I kind of like that. As, I as think, a math major. I, yeah. yeah. I mean, though, I'll admit, when I first, I was in the business school for the first, like, two years of my college degree. And um, I did really regret that I was not learning math anymore. Like, the math part also satisfies intellectual interests. Like, I, I felt like I was, like, sinning somehow, you know? Like, as if I were raised in, like, a ancient Greek community of people who think that, like, the path to, like, real truth, you know, and enlightenment is through, like, geometry or something like that. When I, like, realized I wasn't going to learn any more math, you know, having stopped at, like, business calculus one, I was I was sad. I felt disappointed. Um, so it's not just a signaling aspect for me. It's also, like, you know, it just so happens that it's also extremely useful for signaling. So <laughs> that is a big part of it. No, that makes sense. But I was I was pretty much satisfied math wise after getting through all the calculuses and doing um, abstract algebra and linear algebra. I maybe would have taken like it'd be cool if I could have done like one more course like abstract algebra. Uh, I would have been down for that. Um, but I was pretty much like satisfied mathematically from there. Like that's that's enough for me, you know. How how do you think your life would be different now if you had done that? You had major in math. You took one more math course, you know, a proof based class like abstract. Um, uh, I have no idea. Okay. Yeah. So, what what motivates you then to give this advice to your younger self? It's not because it, you know, not doing this blocked you from something in particular. You just vaguely think you would have enjoyed this more or would have been more efficient? I think it's kind of just a more efficient way of achieving the goals that I'm roughly trying to achieve, somewhat achieving. Um, yeah. I probably would have had slightly more options for jobs than I have now, although I also have a bunch of programming experience, so, like, that also kind of helps. Um, mainly it's, like, I've realized now what value I extracted uh, on the academic side from college and like I'm like this is how I would more efficiently go about it and then this gives more room for uh, exploration on the other side you know it would have given me more time to take like exploratory classes or like I don't know join clubs or something like hypothetically a philosophy club right yeah I've heard of those is there anything past college that you, I guess, wish were different or some outlook or ideas you wish you had started employing earlier? Like new ideas, well, practices I've acquired since college. Yeah, or changes you've seen in yourself. I mean, I, I know you've reported you're a different person than you used to be. Uh, yeah. And in a way that you think, you know, is good. Like, is there... You know, is there more of that? Like, could you have induced that earlier? Like, what, you know, what was past you missing, maybe? Well, a lot of those changes when I talk about being uh, just kind of a shit person earlier in my life, those are, a lot of those happened already by the time I got into college. Um, but I have, I do think that I'm, like, less neurotically anxious and insecure about certain like social things I just feel more confident and capable of like getting what I'm looking for out of so social experiences things like parties uh, bars or whatever um, which is not to be anymore. underrated by the way I think there's lots of people you know e even into like the middle of their life that don't feel confident getting what they're looking for in complex yeah. social situations I mean I still struggle I'm just more like relaxed about it there was sort of a which is very when I was younger and this is you know even in like later college years um it felt more uh like yeah I was just more worried constantly about how I was coming off to people and you know didn't feel comfortable expressing what I actually wanted and, and how I like felt I feel like I can bring a more Relaxed demeanor to a lot of these, uh, to a lot of these things, um, you know, and that just feels like something you get by aging, less something that you gain through principles, you know, um, that I could pass down my past, yeah, self, 
uh, somehow. Uh, yeah, and I think also just a, a greater variety of experience when you, like, as you age, you start finding out that um, more people than you expect have the complex inner world of insecurities and, you know, intellectual aspirations and existential dread and that kind of stuff. Like, find out that, yeah, no, it's not just you. And it's not just the people that you immediately find interesting that you can talk to. It's also the people who maybe you find intimidating um, or that you can't think you can't understand. Uh, I have a broader, I have, a, I have just greater confidence that I can like be more fully myself around people and that it will be understood by more than I might've expected when I was younger. And also greater comfortability just being like, and for those who don't like what they see, like I don't really mind that they're not going to like what they see. It's sort of like, I'm comfortable with knowing that there's like a seriously, there's a significant tribe of people on this planet who I can, uh, get along with. Um, even being my like weird, overly analytical, existentially dreadful self. Uh, it's like, I know there's enough of those people around that I don't have to be so bothered by the, uh, you know, being like totally misunderstood by, um, certain people you know and it's really comforting like finding that group and it doesn't like I, seemingly it doesn't even have to be very big i feel like just yeah. knowing that there are like five people out there yeah who came from similar experiences like had similar struggles like try to think about the world in similar ways is like really really nice five is totally sufficient for that, why would like, you that's, need, that's like plenty yeah i would need more than five no i i agree i yeah yeah Although ideally you hope those five people probably like pair bond and make a little family. So you make a, you make like a little tribe community out of, out of that. Um, that would be ideal, you know, but as a good seed. Yeah. It, well, it's five in this generation. And then you hope if they each have, you know, four kids, it's 10 in the next generation or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or, or you have like five core people. Right. And then like people they know. You know, so you, so you can still have parties. Right. 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 <laughs> but uh, you only need you only need five real homies. Yeah, I'm I'm one of the five. Really, it's four homies. Right, that's what I'm imagining. I think that's a good number. Yeah. But okay, so you would basically you would tell your younger self to not get into nicotine, like change how you approach college, and then. Right. And then this third piece is basically you just naturally gain experience. Like there's just give, less give social less anxiety. Fucks. Yeah. Give less fucks. And um, also you should know there's more people with inner worlds like yours than you realized. Yeah. Also, you forgot, like, don't bother smoking weed. That was also one. And, and don't bother That's smoking difficult. weed. Ideally, the ideal amount of weed smoking is greater than zero. But I need to not have control over it. Or... You do need to have control over it? Well, because I can't really, con you know, smoke the optimal amount, I need a dictatorial authority. I to, see, I see. To parcel it out as needed. Okay. Yeah. Do you think there are changes? Like, what, what intervention, if you could time travel to your past self right now, would have given you healthier weed habits? You could kill me. <laughs> Maybe non-extreme intervention. Yeah, like a, a surgical strike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like on it, me, it, like when I'm playing outside when I'm like five or something. I well, I would maybe. stop it. I was I was hoping right it was a slightly older version of you and it involved more conversation. But um, I guess if you want a surgical strike, no, let's go with the surgical strike. Okay, okay, yeah, that's totally that's fair. Good. It's surgical after all. Avi, what do you think works well about our friendship? What? what why is? Why do we have good conversations? Like, why is it enjoyable? What about us makes this work? Do you want the real answer? No, I want the fake answer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I want the real answer. Um, the, uh, I mean, honestly, I think it's because you're very intellectually curious and you will argue about stuff forever. No, no, I won't. And, you, <laughs> <laughs> and you'll like, um, like you're not just uh, uh, someone who can 
you understand all the things that I want to say even when I'm not being perfectly clear. That's one thing. That's nice. You're interested in hearing it. And also, it's a two-person participatory cooperative process. You will uh, craft new ideas and say uh, ridiculous things. <laughs> um, and that's that's what makes like good conversation for me. Both people trying to piggyback off of each other or challenge each other. Um, you know, especially in philosophy, um, like it helps for both people involved to have the completely ridiculous, like belief that they are capable of redoing all of philosophy from the ground up. And, um, I think you have that belief and uh, it's, it's important and very helpful for us having fun conversations because a lot of what we're doing, we're like, we, we encounter some new topic or argument and the style of our conversation about it, it makes the most sense if you assume that both of us actually think that we can figure it out uh, better by just like, or we can at least figure it out by just talking about it. And then we'll, we'll like have a clear idea of what all the important bits of some topic is just by, just by arguing. And, you know, we'll, if needed to, we'll consult further texts, but you know, not necessary. I'm sure if we just hash it out, you know, we'll, we'll, fi- we'll find the path through, um, I yeah. think we're right, though. Don't I mean, I mean a lot of, of the times we're, we're right. <laughs> I, I admit, sometimes <laughs> our conversation happens to just be rediscovering <laughs> philosophy that other people have thought of before. Yeah, but I, I think we're you know, if there's one objective truth, it has to be that the two of us have access to it. Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely. Yeah, most of the yeah the other. There's another, you're, um, you're very, you're very non-judgmental and, um, you've got high, high openness, uh, which makes it feel, you make a safe space for hot takes. Um, and it's like, you kind of an interesting, everyone I've met who's like kind of smart, clearly at some point thought they were a genius and usually have some kind of ego problem. They're normally like men, basically, and like they do, you know, like domination seeking, you know, power thing. There's a there's this like very egotistical, sort of aggressive component, like or undertone of a lot of intellectual conversations between would be think boys, and you you have an interesting mix where like I don't think you're like particularly humble. Um, but you're not really interested in the, like, you don't really have this undertone of aggression at all. And, uh, like, while you may not be humble, there's, uh, like a lot of associations with the word, like, ego, which, like, don't apply to you. Um, and make it much, you make it very, like, pleasant to argue with about stuff where I'm just honestly telling you some complicated thought I think is true. Uh, the fact that you're not like trying to like dominate me or, um, embarrass me or like burnish your own, you know, genius, um, you know, it makes it like so much more pleasant <laughs> than maybe the average conversation would be with someone who is just as interested in you as a lot of these things and has the same kind of like, intellectual uh, uh, pastimes. I mean, I appreciate you too much to try and embarrass you, right? Like this, this would be such a waste. You just spent your, you know, effort and mind like bringing to me some really cool new idea. Like what, you know, how horrible would that be if I go and insult you? That, see, this seems like the people who do that are, I don't know, they're, they're missing something. Yeah. I mean, typically they're compensating for insecurities, past embarrassments, and, uh, you know, someone dominated them at some point, and now they need to dominate everything around them to be safe, you know? Yeah. Seeking safety (laughs) or self-aggrandizement. You're uh, not really interested in those things. And um, so, like, the main thing we do, talking about philosophy, politics, just kind of analytical stuff... Uh, doesn't come with a lot of the negative side effects that go with those conversations with like randomly selected people. Um, 
So it's a great mix of all the upsides and like none of the downsides. Uh, well, that's of, a very of, sweet of, way of philosophy putting it. and yeah. you know pseudo intellectualism. It's yeah. Great. Thank you. Well, that w- that was a very kind description. I appreciate it. No, thank you, man. Elliot, what a... No, 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 no. no. Okay. I want to ask you a question. Oh, great. Okay, I'm excited. What's, uh, what's going on here? What's the purpose of this? What's the purpose of this conversation? Of uh, these microphones, the tripod, this confusing... Uh, Adobe Audition. Don't, don't give away my secrets. What are, you, what, are you, what are you doing here? I really want to have conversations with really interesting people. Mm-hmm. That seems so fun. This is one of my favorite activities. And I want to share them with the world. I feel like sometimes, maybe even a lot of the time, the people I get to interact with on a day-to-day basis like say really, really insightful, cool things. And I really like these people. And there's a bunch of other people out there who I haven't even met yet, who I know I'd have good conversations with. Uh, And this could be really valuable to the world. I'm pretty sure. Basically, you just had a bunch of conversations with people where a moment they said something happened and you were like, fuck, dude, the world must know. Yes. Yeah. The world must know. And not only that, but I think there's a niche I, I really love what Re- Lex Friedman does, yeah. where he gets a bunch of really smart people. And of course, he's good about getting you know the right sort of analysis out of them for us all to update the left half of our brain with, even though that's a, you know, that's a false dichotomy. Yeah. But we do a little pseudoscience. He, <laughs> we do a little pseudoscience. He's also really good at getting like the heart out of people. I feel like this is something that a lot of, you know, past me plus like a lot of smart people I know can relate to is that you focus way more on the like abstractions than the like who are people behind their ideas side of things. So I, I w- would really like to combine like what are all of the interesting ideas that you have? Also, who are you as a person? Like what makes you tick? Like, you know, what sort of insights can people who are sort of like smart and alone in the world gain from people who have successfully built connection or understood themselves that I think that's like a really interesting niche. Yeah. Uh, I kind of, it, it's uh, people, people cringe at Lex Friedman when he asks like, so what's the meaning of life? Yeah. But, uh, I'm so glad he does it. I'm very glad he does it. Yeah. It's hard. It's so hard if you're a person who really likes abstract ideas to know how to build human connection. Like, I feel like... (laughs) You might have had a slightly uh, more... A worse sample in a math PhD there. Um, But, but yeah. No, I mean, mean, maybe... Okay, maybe I'm generalizing too much to other people. But I feel like for me even, right? Like, you know, pre-entering math PhDs, pre-anything... It's just the the sort of stuff you think about or care about is not people in general. Uh, that's I think that's how it was for a long time. Like uh, it's just you know easier slash more interesting slash there's more resources that speak in the style of language that I care about to learn about computer science and math and econ and physics and whatnot. Um, but turns out human connection is really beautiful and meaningful, and I think a lot of people would do well to gain the same sort of knowledge that they have on the analytical side of things to the human connection side of things. And if what I can do is like help people figure that out 1% more, then I'll have succeeded. I think that's, that's a really good thing to have done for the world.